I thank you that eye has not seen, neither has ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love thee. But he's shown them to us by his spirit. Father, we are trusting by your spirit all the wonderful things that you've done, that you're doing, that you have prepared for us. We thank you, Father, for our moms. We thank you for our ladies, Father, in the church today and those with, watching with us, Lord. We're grateful for the saints that are assembled here and those that are with us online, Father. We just thank you for all the goodness, your grace, your mercy, and your love. In Jesus' name, I has not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for us who love him. In Jesus' name we pray. And anyone who's grateful for that said... Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, band. Wow. You guys are really good. It's beautiful. Beautiful, you guys. Happy Mother's Day, ladies. Blessings on all of you. We wouldn't be, thank you, Ray. We wouldn't be here without you, and we're really blessed to be in church today. We're grateful for all of you that are here this morning. For those of you that are watching with us, happy birthday, Thelma, and happy Mother's Day to you. And uh, God bless all of you again one more time here as we move forward here. And thank you, Brian, for those that really, really, those, those great songs and great word about moms. I can pass on my first chapter here for... <laughs> <that's>, uh, <laughs> we'll just move right into... Uh, uh, that, no, that's, that's very, very good. He's, he's a very, very knowledgeable, sensitive, uh, Bible-believing Christian, and we're grateful that he's part of this ministry. Amen. Father, we're grateful. We're grateful again. We celebrate our moms. We celebrate mothers. We celebrate the ladies, Lord. We bless every female today that believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And for those that are not saved, we intercede right now. We stand in the gap, and we pray that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that you'd open their eyes. Lord, you turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto you, Lord, that they may receive the forgiveness of their sins, and they may receive inheritance, which is sanctified by faith in you, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for every person that hears this. I pray that no one would be weary in well-doing, but every lady that hears this message would be strengthened with might by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're just continuing on uh, talking about our subject for the last couple of weeks. And the subject is, is entitled Going On to Perfection. If you excuse me for a minute. I brought a bag of goodies that I want to talk about in a minute here. But we are talking from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and this is from King James. This is, my Bible is a King James version of the Bible, and uh, I pray that everyone has a Bible. Uh, we've got a whole bookcase full of Bibles. If you want a Bible, you can take it. There are many versions, uh, King James, New King James, Amplified, and New Living Translations are the four that I use the most often when I speak. So if you have those, you'll be right in line with what we're talking from. But most of the time, I do uh, use the King James, even though some people think it's uh, archaic, but I just really love the King James Version. So uh, Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 says, Therefore leaving... And I added in the first principles, but leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. So uh, the title is called Going On to Perfection. And so when we uh, look in terms of our Christianity, uh, that we are, uh, no one's perfect, and we acknowledge that right up front, but Jesus Christ is perfect. Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God, never sinned, and He's perfect this day at the right hand of the Father. But uh, going on for us to go on to perfection is to go on to maturity. All of us should 
uh, be concerned with growing up into Christ in all things. The Apostle Paul said that, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened so that you could grow up into Christ in all things and be uh, more mature of a believer. Uh, we don't want to stagnate in our growth. We don't want to uh, hit a plateau and not proceed or progress any further toward that because the Scripture says that mature Christians could, should go on to perfection or grow on to grow, go on to maturity in their Christianity. So again, as as I and we we suggest, we'll suggest in this that Hebrews is written by the Apostle Paul, and so the Apostle Paul says, "Let's go on to perfection." And then he says, "Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works." Those things should be very basic to every mature Christian in the room and watching with us. Those people that have been in the body of Christ for a while, they don't. Continue continually lay the foundation of repentance from dead works. You and I know without identifying what a dead work is, it's just a fruit of the flesh. It's the fruit of your life or former life. It's the things that you have left behind when you were born again. You came into the kingdom of God. And so now you are not laying the foundation of repentance from dead works. Uh, and we're not learning about faith towards God in the sense that uh, we have comprehended uh, uh, some of the basics of scripture, scripture that we are now growing up in Christ in our faith and in maturity. And so uh, we're not talking about doctrine of baptisms. There are several baptisms talked about in scripture. We're not talking today about laying on of hands. Praise God. We believe in laying on hands. I love it when, you know, hey, let me just tell you something this morning. I had a repaired, I have a written, repaired knee and healed in Jesus' name. But when I wear certain shoes, then I end up, I'm, I'm kind of limping, you know. So I'm walking in the door this morning, and, and I was trying to hide it, but uh, John's down by the door. Brother John is down by the door. And he said, Pastor, you're limping. I said, uh, I'm, I'm fine, you know. And so he put his hands on me. Amen. I didn't ask him to, but he put his hand on me. And instantly, I stood up straight, and I kicked my foot, and I'm going, Thank you, Jesus, and thank you, John, for putting your hand on me. We believe in the laying on of hands. We want to pray for the sick. We want to pray for, uh, we want to pray for impartations and, and transmission of blessing. We want you to be blessed. But laying on of hands for somebody, it isn't just for somebody that's laying in, at the point of death that you walk in and you lay hands on them, believing that they'll rise up from the deathbed, but it's any thing that you have faith for and I had faith to receive for a, a sore knee to all of a sudden you know all of a sudden the kink is out and I'm walking and and uh, Johnny laid his hand on me praise God and it just boom I walked right into the church and and for, I was kind of crawling up the the sidewalk there just kind of dragging a little bit but praise God that happened instantly to me and I just want to share that with you because I want to give God the glory for it and so God gets glory over simple things like that it's not you know I mean we want to hear about uh, cancer and we want to hear about heart uh, cancer being healed and, and hearts being uh, you know someone who had uh, an imperfect heart or something is fixed or, a, or an organ donation or something that is major right and then we'll get together as a church and we'll hey, lay hands and we'll pray and we'll have a prayer but no hey it's for the little things of, of our Christianity I want I want my wife to lay hands on me when I when I don't feel good when I when I got a little bit of dizziness or something rebuke that in Jesus name put your hand I go to my wife all the time put your hand on me and rebuke that thing off me and man that goes because I believe the word of God the simplicity of the laying on of hands is for you and for me and if you ignore that if you're ashamed of the gospel if you're ashamed to to do the little things you're missing out on so much that's, that God has for us. And so I, I amplify that idea, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works of faith towards God or doctrine of baptisms or the laying out of hands and of resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit, leaving the basics. Let's go on. Let's not lay again the first principles of maturity in Christianity. What are the basics? Let's just call them out. Christ is God. The first thing that I have on my list, and you can determine if you want to what are the most basic things about Christianity. Number one on my list is Christ is God. Because you know how, many of the, how much of the world doesn't know and believe that Christ is God? It's just, where are they at? But that's number one, leaving the basics. Two, trusting the Bible as the holy and complete word of God. 
God's big enough that he could have, he could say what he wants and complete it in, in these books, 66 books of the Bible. We believe this is the word of God. That's number two. Number three, praying to the Father in Jesus' name. Jesus said, hitherto you shall ask me nothing, but whatsoever you ask the Father in my name. We pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Now, I know a lot of people talk, talk to Jesus all the time. They talk to Jesus all the time. They talk to Jesus all the time. But Jesus told us to pray to the Father in Jesus' name. So that's, that's what I consider a basic and everybody should maybe move on to talking to your heavenly Father because Jesus is at the right hand. So when you're talking to the Father, you're talking to Jesus at his right hand, praying to the Father in Jesus' name, belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son of God and his sacrifice. That is the, one of the basic things. We can't preach that over and over again because Paul said going on to maturity, and that's what we're talking about today, leaving the first principles of the doctrines of Christ and going on to maturity. So we leave these basic things because they're foundational in our life. They're not going to change. They're rock solid. We're not, on, we're not being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. No, because we've locked down these principles in our lives, knowing that we're saved, knowing that we were born again, know that, knowing that we are a new creation in Christ Jesus and that we have eternal life. My eternal life doesn't fluctuate, neither does yours. God is not wishy-washy. He said that if you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, you have eternal life. Therefore, we hold fast to our profession of faith without wavering. You know, I know that sometimes when world is weird and, and life is weird and, and maybe you're weird, but sometimes you've got to have locked down faith that God's not weird. He's solid as a rock. His word is solid as a rock. I can stand on his word. I can trust him and believe for these basic things. Then going on in some of the basic, this is basic right here, number six, knowing the voice of the Holy Spirit by faith. I, as a Christian, I am called. I'm not talking about as a pastor, as a Christian. I am called to spend enough time alone with God per day some might say per week, no, per day, to give God a little bit of time every single day. Now, people have developed that into time of expansion more and more, time spent with God every single day, which develops and grows and pretty soon. But, but knowing the voice of the Holy Spirit, because you've grown in your Christianity, all of a sudden you go, whoa. That was God. Whoa, that was God. Or at times, the prompting or the nudge or even the voice of a single word spoken to you by the Holy Spirit. I mean, I, I could stand here all the rest of our service today and tell you stories of things that, you know, I mean, when, I, when, I, when my income doubled back when I was working a regular job, uh, God said, rewrite your resume. I was in the car praising God, just singing, you know, hallelujah, Jesus, hallelujah, and I heard, heard it louder than my own singing, rewrite your resume. Wow, and that was weird, driving on, singing, praising Jesus, and then I heard it again, rewrite your resume. Okay, that's God. I'm gonna do that. How often, do you, how often does God talk to me? I mean, through his word, he talks to me all the time. And then the Holy Spirit whispers to me at times, but then sometimes he interrupts because he's God and he has the authority to interrupt. And I'm, pray, I'm grateful that, that he interrupted me because I rewrote my resume and I got a job that doubled my income. It happened in, within a span of six months. So when you listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit, he can change your life. Amen. He can do it for you just as much as he can do it for me. Amen. All right, so uh, number seven, salvation is not the only subject for a growing, growing Christian. I mean, some of us grew up, and the only message we ever heard was salvation every Sunday. Every Sunday, salvation, salvation, accept Christ, accept Christ. No, we've accepted Christ. Now Paul says, let us leave the first principles of the doctrine of Christ and let us go on to maturity. Let us progress forward and grow up into Christ in all things. All right, so then uh, uh, perfection there again is spiritual maturity. God has plenty more for the hungry 
Christian. And that's a, that's a challenge that you don't have to tell anybody about it, but you have to examine your own heart. Am I a hungry Christian? Hungry for spiritual food, hungry for fellowship, hungry for more of God, hungry to move forward, hungry to leave the beggarly elements of this world and to, to cast the cares of, of life on God and to grow up and move on in Christ. And, and so uh, learning, seeking, studying, uh, those things that accompany salvation. So if we go back here in this verse up here, uh, it says that, uh, let's see, in, verse, in, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9, we're in chapter 6, verse 9, uh, in this context, but beloved, we're persuaded better things for you, better things of you. God wants better things for you. In your life, there is a place of better things for you. Some say, well, hey, I've got this great relationship with God. Life is good. God even has better things for you if you want to move forward, if you want to go on. But there are people that are stagnated or not happy, and therefore we can stand on the word of God that says God has better things for you. Beloved, we are persuaded better things for you and things that accompany salvation things that accompany your salvation. There are things that accompany your salvation. I want uh, many people go, uh, I've heard it over and over. I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful to be saved. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. 100%. I agree with you. High five, slap. Yes. Amen. But when the Bible tells you that there are things things that accompany your salvation, then you probably ought to take some time to find out what else comes with it. And it doesn't take long before you hear what other preachers are saying when you tune in on the radio or you tune on, on, a, on a DV, uh, when you tune in to, uh, online, whatever your source of finding out from what, what people are preaching, it doesn't take long to find out other things that come with salvation. One of the most basic things is we believe in healing. I believe in healing. This morning, I, because I have faith in Christ to heal me, I was kind of limping along, and John saw I was limping, and he put his hand on me. I believe in the laying of hands, and boom, I can bend my knee. I could kick it. I can dan I could stay. I could dance a little if I want to. When I, when I was walking, though, I could barely lift my leg. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it's great to have people that just see and boom, they lay a hand on you and pff, something changes and it's, it's good. It's great. It's freedom because there was pain. There was pain involved. Amen. All right, so go forward here. Um, things that were persuaded of things that accompany your salvation. And the New Living Translation said things that come with salvation. And everybody needs to know this. If you don't pursue it, that's your business, but you need to know it. Because as soon as you know it, guess what's going to happen? You're going to go, why don't I participate? Why don't I pursue that? Why don't I step up and believe God for some of the things that come with salvation or uh, things that accompany our salvation? And uh, so I, I've talked about it forever in my, my, uh, in my preaching is we talk about a salvation package. A salvation package. Now, uh, you know, when, when uh, 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 there's many... You move into a new home and some really nice neighbors, they come over and bring you stuff, right? They bake a cake or they make a pie or they buy you something nice. And, and that's really nice that people do stuff like that. It's really, really great that they do stuff. And, and you know, so it's like, a, a, it's like an entry-level uh, blessing to greet you and bring you into the neighborhood. But when you come to the things of God, there is a salvation package of things that are granted to you just because you accepted Christ. Christ. Someone goes, well, uh, I don't really want anything from God. I just want to know that I have eternal life. Well, that, that's absolute. Praise God. We're grateful for that. We trust God for the fact that our eternal home is heaven. But there is a salvation package. There is a package that is a, a greetings, welcome aboard that God has given to you. And it's unfortunate for how many Christians don't know what's in their salvation package and they haven't believed for the things that God has already provided simply by accepting Christ as your Lord and your Savior. So those are things that accompany your salvation. In, uh, in the Old Testament, these, this salvation package includes the things that were bought and paid for by Jesus Christ, paid for by his blood. And in the Old Testament, the word salvation, in the, this is Old Testament now, the word is Yeshua. It's Jesus' name in Hebrew, Yeshua. It's salvation, 
deliverance, well faring, prosperity, and victory. All right, so let's just, let's not jump way off into these things, but let's just consider a, a, the few of these ideas that Jesus' name in the Old Testament, Yeshua, it's Hebrews H 3444 in your, in your concordance, and you, your salvation is the first thing on the list, praise God, in, under Jesus' name in the Old Testament. But then there's deliverance. You may be waking up in the middle of the night terrorized by the same dream over and over again, and God has deliverance. He has paid for you to not wake up sweating in fear over some dumb dream that the enemy keeps sowing into your life. And you need to know that the name Yeshua has pray, paid the price for you to have uh, deliverance from that bad dream. You get deliverance from that bad memory. You get deliverance from that negativity of your past life. Hey, every one of us could sit down, fold our legs, and start crying over what happened to us when we were young, over what happened to us when we were teenagers, what happened to us in our first or second or third or fourth or fifth marriage. We could all sit and really get upset and bunt out of shape over bad things that have happened to us. But praise God, the Bible says in his name, his name is Yeshua in the Old Testament. And one of the things is deliverance. Deliverance when I'm in trouble. I've told you story after story after story of when I was alone and things would happen when I'd be surrounded by people that looked like they'd like to pound me to to dust and, and really do me wrong and somehow, some way, God would provide an avenue to get out of it and I'd be, get out scot-free and I'd be going, praise you, Jesus, thank you for deliverance. I want someone today to finally acknowledge that Jesus Christ is deliverance. His name is deliverance. He's provided deliverance. He wants deliverance for you. He doesn't want you to stay in that situation. He doesn't want you to stay in that miserable condition. He doesn't want you to stay in whatever thing that the enemy has poured on you, whether it's your memories, maybe it's your, your family that they just keep tormenting you. God has delivered you from that, and you can stand up strong and courageous and say, hey, Hey, I've been bought with a price. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. I'm not going to take that anymore. You can't, you can't hold me in bondage. You can't bind me up. I, I, I cast that down. I break that spirit by the name of Jesus Christ. And then walk free. So I'm, thank you for that. Amen, ladies. That gives me a chance to take a breath. I, you know, that deliverance thing, because I, you know, thank God. Get free. Who this? Hey, Okay, can you back that up? Yes, who the Son has set free is free indeed. That's deliverance. The power in that scripture, whom the Son has set free is free indeed, that will set you free from any deliverance. His name, just say Jesus, your name says deliverance. You know, someone say, well, he couldn't deliver me from, from a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction or a porn addiction or a, or a stealing addiction or a whatever addiction you may be into. Yeah, he can. He could break every single one of them because, hey, there's many of us in this room could stand up and testify how much God has delivered us from some of the bondages, some of the crazy mental things we thought, goofed up heads. If someone could go, my, my head is so goofed up, no one could ever unravel it. Hey, Jesus created it. He can unravel it. He can straighten you out. Just trust him. Believe. Amen. All right. We're talking about, hey, I haven't got very far. We're on the first page. Talking about Jesus' Old Testament name. Hey, here's one well-faring. Hey, we want you to be well on your journey. Well-faring. Hey, prosperity is a word here. Uh, oh, don't say that prosperity in this church. Why? Because we, oh, no, don't say it. Yeah, of course we want prosperity. I want to be a blessing. I want to help someone. I want to offer, uh, I want to have cash if someone needs to have help in this church or, or I want to be able to chip in when we bless a ministry or I want to chip in when, when we, do a, we do something good for somebody and, uh, or, or I want to do some giving in secret where you know it doesn't hurt me to take out a 20 or a 50 and just to slip it secretly to someone else and not even let, not, let, not let them know that it was you. That, that is, it's prosperous when you can just be that free in your relationships or free in your money that, that you can believe to, to do something that generous to somebody else. Maybe a $100 bill. Maybe, maybe a 20 isn't a big enough thing for you. Maybe you're, you're a big giver. Maybe you slip $100 bills. That's great. 
We believe in, in generosity because of prosperity. If I'm not prosperous, I'm going, I can't give that away. That's all I got. And what am I going to do without my money? What am I going to do if I, I can't give anybody anything? That's not prosperity. Prosperity is freedom financially. And there's all kinds of levels of it. And so we believe that Jesus' name includes it in victory. Victory, victory, oh my, is mine. That's Jesus' Old Testament name. His New Testament name for salvation is, is G for Greek. H was for, for Hebrew. G, Greek, 4991, soteria. It's, again, the first word for the, the definition is deliverance, preservation. It's, it's alphabetical, but it's preservation, safety, salvation, deliverance from the molestation of enemies. Delivered from, from being molested by enemies. I'm not going into captivity. Now, thank God we live in the, in, in the, the freest country on earth, the United States of America. God bless America, and I'm free, and I don't have to worry about the government. I don't, not yet, anyway. I don't have to worry about the political system. Not yet, anyway. I don't have to worry about the police department. Well, not yet, anyway. But, uh, but the point here is that deliverance from the molestation molesting of, of, of the enemy. We bind that. We resist that. We cast it down in Jesus' name. And we walk in freedom. We walk in peace, joy, love. Uh, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, the fruit of the Spirit. We're not worried. We're not worried. If someone's listening to me in another country where, where the police are dangerous, where the government's dangerous, where everything's dangerous, you can still be free in these things that God has provided. It's just not unique to the people of the United States of America, but it's unique to this earth in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen while I catch my breath. Amen. All right, he prayed for all these things. It's, uh, the last one on that was uh, the, that which includes the soul's safety. God has provided for your soul to be safe. You know, there was a time where in my young Christianity, I wasn't sure how to protect my soul. And, and I was surrounded by good Christian people that I had tremendous respect for back at Speak the Word. When I, my, my pastors growing up in the Baptist church, I, I was totally respectful of their, their awesome anointing. But you couldn't talk to them about stuff that you could go and talk to the people that Speak the Word because they, were, they, they, could, they could handle anything that you could bring up to them, right? So I'd go and talk to them about stuff. And, and uh, uh, the, they'd help you to realize that you don't have to walk in fear, that Christ has defeated fear. And so now I don't have to be afraid of failing. I don't have to be afraid of losing my job. I don't have to be afraid of sickness. I don't have to be afraid of whatever the enemy wants to make you afraid of. I don't have to be afraid anymore. Christ has paid the price through the, his name and through these things so that I could have soul safety. My soul is safely in the hands of Almighty God. Now, I have to do what, what it takes to cast down imaginations. I have to do what it takes to bring my thoughts captive. I have to do what it takes to control control my mind and not let it wander off into fear and let it wander off into lust and let it wander off into uh, weird, weird, weird stuff. What you open your eyes to, what you look at on, online, what you look at uh, daily, what you're paying attention to is going to invade your life. But, but if you do your part to say no, then this, this which includes soul safety, God will protect you from that stuff and you can walk in this life with joy and peace. Somebody say amen while I catch my breath. Amen. amen. All right, so uh, Hebrews 6, 9 says things that accompany salvation. Uh, let me see up there. Uh, Hebrews 6, 9, we are confident that you are meant for better things and things that come with salvation. So I want everybody to not get off the point until you accept the truth that the Apostle Paul is telling you that maturity in Christianity realizes that there are plenty of things that come with your salvation. And so when we begin to do the investigation, it begins to open your eyes to uh, things that God wants to help you to achieve. For instance, uh, when I was raising two daughters by myself, and try to figure out how to make, make ends meet, you know, we'd pray over what we had and believe God to help us, but then our eyes were open, my eyes were open that God can increase you, and that was when I talked about hearing the, that voice in the car while I was praising the Lord to rewrite my resume, and I rewrote my resume, and then a couple weeks later, I got an offer for a job that doubled my income. So that, that can happen to you. 
That can happen to anyone. God's no respecter of persons. Things can happen. But the thing I was, you know, I, I was seeking God with all my heart. That's one of the keys. You have to, if you're not, God knows how to measure the level of how you seek him. If you're not seeking God with all your heart, the, Jesus kind of gave you an equation in Mark chapter 4 that explains what kind of, how much, how much results happen to your Christian, your Christian life. There's some 30, some 60, and some 100. Some are 30, people that put in 30% of their, their love and effort and time towards God, and they get about a 30% result in the life because of it. Some are 60, some are over halfway of their life is fully committed to God, and therefore you see that kind of result. But the people that are sold out, 100-fold Christians, they see results in their life on a consistent basis based on that equation from Mark chapter 4. I believe it, uh, I, I stand on it, and I encourage somebody to consider that. All right, so, uh, so here's, where we, we, here's where I want you to, uh, someone might get offended by me saying this, and I, I want you to be, just be careful to not get offended, but when I talk about uh, things that accompany salvation, uh, it's okay to ask God what comes with it. And uh, most won't ask. Most won't ask, what else, what else you got, Father? <laughs> I mean, hey, Lord, what else you got for me? When you know him personally, I know a lot of you in here and watching personally. And I could say, what else you got for me? And I wouldn't, <coughs> excuse me, I don't think they'd be offended. And I wouldn't be I'd, it'd be okay for me to say, hey, what, what else is going on? What else, can I, what else can we talk about? What else can we pursue? And, uh, excuse me. Some will say it's not a humble approach. That's a good question right there. Is that pride? Or is that misuse? Or is that disrespect of God? If the Bible says that we're persuaded of better things for you and things that accompany your salvation, then it's okay for me to be bold enough to say, God, what comes with it? What's, what else is in the salvation package? I'll take everything you got. That's the attitude we should have. I'll take everything that you paid for on the cross. I'll take it all. I, take the for, I took the forgiveness of sins. I took deliverance. I took all the, the healing and all the victory that God had. And so now I'm walking in the direction of what he did for me. So going on, uh, remember, remember Jesus' uh, parable about it, the terminology was importunity. Importunity. It's where the guy gets up in the middle of the night and he's got guests and he goes pounds on his neighbor's door in the middle of the night. And his neighbor gets up, up not because he's happy, but he gets up because of his importunity in which he goes and gives what his neighbor has asked for in the middle of the night so his neighbor can greet or help those guests that have come to his house. So importunity is the... Uh, is, is the parts of what has God has provided for you. Christ's full purchase redemption was paid for at Calgary, uh, Calgary, Calvary and in hell. Yeah. It was, Jesus said, it is finished on the cross. But then the Bible says, he that ascended also descended into the lower parts of the earth. And the Bible says that in the book of uh, second chapter of the book of Acts. Peter quoted the psalmist who was quoting Jesus. Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Jesus went down into the heart of the earth. He led captivity captive. The, the, the righteous that were held in Abraham's bosom, he led them to heaven but he also went into the other compartment that was separated by a great gulf fixed and the bible says he even went to the angels that were in prison and preached to the angels in heaven in, 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 in uh, Tartarus so he didn't deliver them out of chains those angels that Peter said were chained in that place in hell he left them there. And he cut through 
the, other, the gulf that was fixed between Abraham's bosom and the torment compartment of hell. And he didn't liberate the torment compartment of hell. Those souls are still there. But he did, did liberate the righteous compartment. And the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 that he led captivity captive. He took that entire, cap, that entire compartment up to heaven. And now because of being born again through his death, burial, and resurrection, a believer, when he's absent from the bottom body, he's immediately present with the Lord. So that's what we believe, and, and that's what Scripture teaches us. And so um, there are things that accompany your salvation. And it's up to a, a Christian to decide what you want to know. And I, got, I want a little dis, dis demonstration right now. I want you to understand this little demonstration because in this last scripture that we used, uh, Hebrews 6, 9, things that accompany, things that accompany your salvation, uh, I want to ask you, when you go to buy, some of you bought a bike, some of you bought a car, some of you bought a TV, some of you bought an appliance, some of you bought a new suit, some of you bought a pair of jeans or a pair of shoes, whatever you bought. When you go there, would you dare ask them what comes with it? When I go there, I always say, does anything come with it? Pastor, why would you do that? Because there's a lot of perks that you leave behind because you didn't ask. And so let me give you an example. All right, so I went to, I went to buy some. Let's just please, please, this is going to, don't let me bore you. But I went to buy a fragrance, right? And so when I get there, out of the counter becomes this wrapped package. It's a fragrance that I wear. And as it comes up to the counter... And she begins to ring it up. I said to her, I says, does anything come with it? And she goes, well, let me look. So all of a sudden, she looks, and there's a travel pack. And in the travel pack is a small little bottle of the same fragrance. Oh, thanks. Cool. And then there's a bottle of, uh, this is called uh, aftershave. Uh, and that's in the travel pack. And also in the travel pack was some... Uh, this is all over gel for the shower. Really? That's all, that was all included and you didn't even tell me about it? And, oh, yeah, I got some more stuff. Oh, hey, by the way, you get a water bottle too. Isn't that a, look at, look at the water bottle. Isn't that cool? And, by the way, uh, while you're up here, uh, here's, here's another one. Have two water bottles. How's that? I said, hey, I'll take the two water bottles. I'll take the aftershave. I'll take the shower gel. I'll take the little travel pack so that instead of putting my glass bottle of fragrance, I can just have a little travel bottle of my favorite fragrance. And guess what? It was all included. It's just, you know what? Either she forgot or what, for whatever reason, she didn't include it but there were lots and lots of perks that were included with my purchase. And so what I'm suggesting today by, by talking about it today, you know, some clerks even look online. You know, they type in real quick. Is there anything like we give you the certificate and you mail it in and they give you a rebate or they send you more stuff, which stuff's fun. I kind of, you know, my wife says, you got to get over stuff, but stuff is kind of cool. But anyways, um, it's an innocent question that should offend no one. When making any significant purchase, you remind the salesperson for, to check for any other perks or things that accompany your full purchase price. Or even if I ask, listen to this, guys. I say, hey, can you cut me a break? Can you give me 40% off? I go, no, I can't give you 40. Well, then give me 30 then. Well, I, can, I can't do 30, but I can do 25. Really? Now, I just got 25% off the full price because I dared to ask. So the reason I brought that up is for this and this purpose only. The scripture says that, see if I can find my place. 
things. Everyone say things. Things Things that accompany salvation. In this verse, the Bible talks about things that accompany salvation. And because I have this bag of good stuff that I got because I asked the question, what do you have? That what, what else is associated with my purchase? Well, the purchase price of Christ's death on the cross provides things that accompany your salvation. So I'm not asking for favors when I believe in deliverance, when I believe in healing, when I believe in help in my finances, help in my family, help in my brain, help in my body, help in this life. These are things that accompany salvation, and I'm not afraid to ask for them. Because of the parable that Jesus said, because of your importunity, the word kind of troubles me there, there's much more that is freely available to most believers that they are just leaving on the table. You're just leaving it on the table when it's been bought and paid for. And so um, in the book of Hebrews, when the Apostle Paul or the writer of Hebrews is talking about these things in these these several chapters that I'm going to just touch on before we close, uh, it says, the things, beloved, were persuaded better things for you and things that accompany salvation, though thus we speak. All right, so now we're crossing over into considering what is Hebrews, and Hebrews' subject matter is faith. Faith is mentioned in Hebrews more than anywhere and the other places in Romans, but in, in Hebrews, Hebrews is next level Christianity. I want to ask somebody today, Someone goes, well, I'm content not knowing all the stuff you're trying to tell me. Okay, then leave the package on the table and just go your way. Enjoy your Christianity at that level. But if you want to participate in next level Christianity, Hebrews talks about faith. And let me just tell you what the most important thing, the first thing mentioned in faith, and I'll I'll get there, but the terminology, by faith, that phrase, by faith, is found 17 times in the book of Hebrews. As faith is next level Christianity, or faith is the next level of of your belief system, and, and Hebrews says that by faith, it's mentioned 17 times, and then it goes on to say, by faith, things that were accomplished to better the human existence, while here on earth. Better the human existence. Okay, we've been taught, and I don't know if anybody teaches anymore, it's been a long time ago. But a long time ago, they taught that misery was part of your your package. That you just need to be miserable. You need to be crabby and mean and ugly because you're going through a tough time as a Christian. And then they come along and said, hey, God paid for you to be joyful, to be peaceful, to be uh, supplied and provided for and delivered and all these things. And all of a sudden, crummy, miserable Christianity changed. And I was, in the, I was caught in the middle because I was raised in miserable Christianity. But then all of a sudden, I've got these great ministers that are preaching about joyful, peaceful, enjoyable Christianity. And I went, that's the greatest thing I ever heard, that I can be a happy Christian Hallelujah, and I want somebody in this room, I want somebody watching to know that you can be a happy Christian, a joyful Christian, that you can be blessed, that you can have things that accompany your salvation, that you can take your faith and you can use your faith. And let's talk about faith a little bit more as we, uh, what is the first occurrence? And this is important that you hear this. The first occurrence of by faith. The term by faith, again, is 17 times. But the first occurrence of the fruit of living by faith, it's a doozy. Acts chapter 15, verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, 
purifying their hearts by faith. Don't everybody jump out of your seat now. That is one of the greatest things I ever heard in my life. That by faith, my heart has been purified. You know you. And some of you don't like you. And some of us didn't like me. And therefore, I was very unhappy about myself. I wanted to change. But by faith, the Bible says that my heart has been purified by faith. Now I can look at it through my own lens and I could see my attitude or I could see my past or I could see my failure or I could see my misery and I could look at it in that term and I could just sit and wallow in it or by faith I can believe that my heart has been purified to a new degree, that my heart has been cleansed, my heart is acceptable to God, that God sees me with a purified heart if I believe it, and it's by faith that I believe that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that I can come boldly to his throne to obtain mercy, to find grace, to help in time of need. I can go there. Why? Because by faith, I, my heart is pure. And if I, my heart is pure, many of us don't go to the throne because we don't think we have pure hearts. Many of us think we have wrong motives. Many of us think we're bad people. Many of us think we're scumbags. But the point is, is that by faith, faith, my heart has been purified and I can come boldly to his throne. Somebody say amen to that. That's beautiful. That is beautiful because there are many that I know that have struggled with condemnation. You've been struggling with guilt. You've been struggling with all these things that are from your past, but old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, and I can do all things through Christ, and I can believe that my heart has been purified by faith. I might even had a, had a bad motive this morning. I might not have liked something that that happened to me on the way to church. I might not have liked the way somebody said something to me on the way, but yet my heart has been purified by faith. And therefore, I can go boldly to the throne to obtain mercy, to find help, to time and help in time of need. Because somebody goes, I could never, never go to the throne to talk to God because, uh, you know, he knows. He knows what, I'm, what I was thinking and what I did. And I, no, but hey, we're purified by faith. And so I can do that in my mind's eye. I can go there in my prayers. I can go there in my worship time. I can go there in my Bible time. I can commune with my Heavenly Father. I can commune with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I can commune with the Holy Spirit. I can enjoy the Bible because my heart has been purified by faith. And your heart, the only thing missing for your heart is the faith aspect, believing that your heart is purified by faith. And that's a great blessing for anyone that wants to move forward in their Christianity. Okay, we're getting late here. All right, the last thing I want you to see here, and this is changing the subject a little bit here, but I want someone to really lock on here that, am I missing a page here? One, two, three. Oh, there it is. Okay, sorry. Uh, all right, so let's run through these very quickly because I'm running out of time. In Hebrews 11:6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But if I have faith, it does please God. It's the reciprocal or the opposite side of the coin there. It, without it... God's not pleased, but with it, with it. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so this message this morning has created faith. And now you can approach God in faith. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For anyone, for those of us that come to God, and we all have if you're a Christian, you must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. I stop there. He's a rewarder. He rewards me. And then I let him fill in the blank. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. All right, Hebrews 4, 2. For indeed the gospel was preached to us to, as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them. It didn't do any good. Why? 
because they didn't mix it with faith. How do I mix faith? You know, you know how you mix faith? You say, I believe it. You say, I believe it, and then you stand on believing it, and you don't back off. I believe it. And therefore, it says, the gospel preached to them as well as to us, but the word which they heard, we're talking about the word here, the gospel did not profit them. I want as much profit out of the things that God has for me as I can have because I don't feel like it's greedy. I just feel like that he provided so much that you can't even barely tap it. And I want to go there, but it says here that didn't profit them because they wouldn't mix it with faith. How do you mix it with faith? Father, I believe what you said. I believe your word. I receive it now in Jesus' name. That's mixing it with faith. You can do it. I can do it. It's a simple prayer. All right, the next one is, how important is faith? Not just a general belief, but specific faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Why do I need faith? Faith to forgive things that are outside of our ability to forgive. There are things that are outside my ability to forgive. Some of the horrendous things that I'm aware of out there in the world because I watched the news too much or I read the newspaper too much or I saw it online or somebody told it to me, I have the capacity to forgive because I have faith and I use it. Even when my brain says, I don't want to forgive them. But by faith, I let it go. By faith, I forgive. By faith. Going on here, lastly, I want to talk to you about even a more important point. I don't know if it's more important. It's more useful. Let me put it this way. No, it can't be more useful. So I, it's, it's something you need to be in your repertoire. When you open your coat and you've got your little Bible or you've got your sword of the Spirit or in your life, you need to know this. And I want you to hear this. This is a parable. In Luke 17, 1, Jesus tells the disciples it's impossible that offenses will not arise. In this life, there's always going to be something that upsets you, always. And you're going to have to get over it. You're going to have to move forward uh, because offenses need to be forgiven. Forgiving offenses seven times seven in one day is, you know, seven times seven or seven times seven, however many times, but in, in Luke chapter 17, 5, Jesus said that when somebody messes with you and you forgive them, you don't get a badge. And the apostles, the disciples said, how many times do I have to forgive them? And he said, you can forgive them seven times in a day. And you know what the response was? Increase our faith. Think about that. You're telling me I got to forgive that low-life scumbag, and I know that right there needs repentance, but if you, somebody has totally done you wrong, and God says, forgive them seven times a day, the disciples went, whoa, increase my faith, God, so that I could act on your word and keep forgiving them for what they did. And you know what Jesus said? After the disciples said, increase our faith, he said, use what you got. Use the faith you have. And here's the story. Jesus told the disciples the parable of the unprofitable servant. In Luke 17, verses 6 through 10, the Lord said, If you had faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Verse 7. And which of you having a servant? Now this is the critical point right here. Every Christian has a servant. I pray you'll never forget this point. Every Christian has a servant called faith. Some never use their servant. Others understand and use their servant all the time. What is the purpose of a servant? The purpose of the servant is to wait on you. 
The purpose of a servant is to do what you tell them to do. Here's what Jesus said. Which of you, in verse 7, have a servant, and he's out plowing or tending the sheep? All right, so you've got the servant out there plowing your field. You've got the servant out there feeding your sheep. And you, and, he, and you say to him when he comes in from the field, hey, sit down, I'll wash your feet, and I'll let you rest for a little while. No, he doesn't say that. He says to the servant, prepare my food, gird yourself, and serve me until I have eaten, till I have drank the things I wanted, and afterwards you get to eat and drink. That's, that's the servant, man. You told him out in the field, you told him to feed the sheep, you told him to come in and cook my food, go get my slippers, do what I tell you to do, all right? Verse 9, does he thank the servant? That's almost bizarre. If you served me, I'd thank you for it. But your servant here, Jesus said, you don't thank him. It says, does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not, Jesus said. So likewise, when you've done all the things which are your duty to do, we are, say we are unprofitable servants. We've only done that which is our duty to do. Here's the point. God has given every Christian a measure of faith. Faith is to be used like a servant. The servant is to be out in the field plowing. The servant is to be feeding the sheep. The servant is to come in and cook my food. The servant is to put the uh, food on the table. The servant is to clean the table. The servant is to wash the dishes. The servant is to do everything in life that is needed. Jesus said, and afterwards, do you say thank you for plowing? Do you thank you for feeding the sheep? Do you thank you for feeding, uh, uh, creating, uh, fixing my meal or washing the dishes? He says, no, you don't thank your faith. You just keep going with it. You just keep using your faith. And this example here says, so likewise, when you've done all those things which are commanded you, we say we're unprofitable servants. We've done that which is our duty to do. So when we compare that last verse, faith is doing all these things for you. And now, just as that faith was unprofitable, we go with our attitude to God is, we're unprofitable servants. Our duty is to serve you with all our heart. Amen. All right, so what do we do with this teaching? Do we skip it as undiscernible? Or do we draw wisdom from it for anyone who will venture out to believe what it says or reveals? What does it reveal? The subject the Lord responds to is the disciples were asking for more faith. So he answered the question. The Lord's response was, use what you have. They said, he said, they said, increase our faith. And Jesus said, which of you have a servant? Can you believe that faith is the servant of the believer? That's a good question. You'll say to the servant, one job is complete, go on to the next. Do you thank the servant? No, it's his duty. And if you have faith. All right, so lastly today as we close, the development of the substance called faith is a real tangible thing for believers. Who is the servant? Faith is the servant of the believer. If you have faith, you will say, faith always speaks or it's not faith. You will always say what you believe, or it's not faith. A lot of people say, well, Jesus is in my heart, and I have faith, but there's a point when you're going to have to testify. There's a point when you're going to have to say, yes, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter if it's to your mom. It doesn't matter if it's to your, your unsaved dad. It doesn't matter if it's to your unsaved children or someone in the workplace. There comes a time when you're going to have to say, yes, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. It's the testimony of your faith that comes out of your mouth that Jesus is talking about here. If you have faith, you will say it. Faith always speaks or it's not faith. Number four, fourth, faith can multitask, so put it out there for all your needs. It doesn't just mean that God can supply this need, but he can't supply that need. Yeah, he can, he can cover all your bases. That's faith. 
Do you thank your faith for working and producing? No, you thank the Lord. But your faith is a servant for you to use. Number six, doing your duty. Just as faith has a duty, we as Christians have a duty to God. Number seven, if you have faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In conclusion, God gave some faith to all believers to help them in this life. That's where you start. God gave some faith to every believer. How, how do you know that? In Romans 12, 3, the last scripture today, God has dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. So faith is the servant. Use it or lose it. When you say lose it, when you begin to use your faith by speaking and declaring the things that God has for you, then as you speak it, you're developing your faith. You feed your faith. After faith is done, the things that's called, feed your faith on the Word of God, and your faith will grow. And you can get to a place where before when you couldn't believe for anything, now you can agree with people in prayer. Now you can lay your hands on the sick. Now you can uh, step out in faith in great and mighty ways because you're applying what Jesus told us about faith. Can someone say amen this morning? Amen. amen. All right, so that's a, uh, that is an amazing lesson that I learned and I wanted to share with you. It's called Faith, the Servant to the Believer. And uh, we can, uh, every one of us needs to grow in it. But uh, if you just start stepping out, speak your faith, stand on the word, and expect it to come to pass is basically the Bible equation for the things that God has for you. Let's bow our heads this morning and let's say the prayer of salvation. Let's say, Dear God in heaven, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that He died on the cross for me and was raised again from the dead so that I could have eternal life. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior and be my Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I receive your forgiveness now. And I receive eternal life. And I thank and praise you for it. Thank you for faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. We're going to uh, receive the morning offering as the last thing we do this morning, and we just want to encourage all of you. I forgot about it, by the way. Pastor Nancy's gone. Usually she takes care of it. But uh, Scripture says this, and, you know, one of the things is that when a person participates in the church offering, whether it's through a, a tithe, a gift, an offering, or even if you just drop something in, it's got to start somewhere, and some people just drop something in. But if you will have faith that when you drop something into the offering, it's going to God, and if you believe that what you dropped in the offering is going to God, then you can believe for him to multiply your seed sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness. The Bible talks about God multiplying our seed sown. That thing, if you believe it, is a seed in the offering, and then seeds produce more, and you'll increase and begin to give more. You know, some, some in here may, may, man, it might be a struggle to put the dollar in the offering. Others are putting thousands of dollars into the, into the kingdom of God. And they're doing it because they've grown in their faith to the point where they believe that God is the source of their blessing. And now they trust him with their money and they tithe, they give offerings and they, they give to good works and they, they chip in all the time. You know, there's a person I know that is the most generous person I ever met. That's my wife. And so I just encourage people that uh, generosity grows and faith grows. And when you start, well, it, took, it took work for me when I started. Uh, they, they said, hey, given it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall make it under your bosom with the same measure you meet. It'll be measured to you. I, yeah, God, I need help because, man, I got two kids and, and uh, I need help. And I'm going to put this in the offering. And boom, I started to put more in the offering. And I started to believe. And it started to increase. And God started opening doors. And I got a promotion. I got raised. And then, then things happened. And I believe it because someone taught it to me and they taught it to me from the Bible.
I encourage someone right now that may be struggling financially. Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. And for, but with the same measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. Father, we thank you for the tithes, the offerings, and the gifts that come into our church. We promise as a church to use it for your work and for your service so that the kingdom of God can be blessed. Thank you for the tithers in this church. Thank you for the generous givers in this church. Thank you for the resources and the people that are sowing them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. And uh, uh, pardon me? Rev class on Saturday at 9, and you are invited. 11 years we've been having Rev class. You're invited to talk about the book of Revelation.